Well, good evening, everyone. Wonderful to see our trustees and patrons and Lou Caden, uh, who chairs our nominating governance. Great to see you. And all of you have come out here tonight. Uh, I am thrilled to have this conversation, not only because it is a critical conversation to have, but Nicholas Bergruen is one of the truly um, great thinkers on these topics, but pulling together people to really rethink the big issues of our time. I will say that this book has gotten a lot of attention and um, there's been a lot of programs and most have focused on the recommendations in the book for how to revive or renovate U.S. democracy. But there's whole sections of the book that really look at the impact of globalization and how we harness it and the social contract, the rise of China and what that means for the future of the world. And tonight, because we're Asia society, I'm going to tend toward that. But you're welcome when we turn to questions to bring out you know, more of those domestic questions, because Nicholas has a lot of thoughts on those topics also. Nicholas, because you appreciate literature, I can't help but start with a Rumi quote, my favorite. And Rumi, in one of his poems from 700, 800 years ago, said, Beyond rightness and wrongness, there is a field. I'll meet you there. And I raise that quote because one thing that struck me in the book is a, a lack of fear about our future of the world and more of an interest and fascination with the new models and the new kinds of prosperity and the new forms of governance and the experimentation happening. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. I wouldn't say it's third way but I would say it's, it's a more confident presentation to me about tackling these and what we might learn from the rise of Asia, what we might learn from um, you know, all the different forms that are taking form. Well, that's so welcome. <laughs> that Asia Society and everyone here, many thanks. I uh, appreciate we can talk about these serious subjects. Um, well, it's a very beautiful uh, quote, uh, Rumi quote, I think it's one of the most inspiring ones. Mm -hmm. And um, I, actually, I think, it, to me, it resonates. We've had, in my mind, on average, uh, 50 very good years, um, I think, globally. Um, no major wars, uh, better incomes on average all around the world, uh, a uh, globe that cooperated, uh, but it seems that things are changing. And um, why? I mean, my own opinion is globalization, multiculturalism, technology may be too fast. We're still analog creatures. Uh, this is digital change, maybe too fast. But after these 50 years, I can feel the change, and I think it's everywhere, not just here in America, uh, not just in the West, it's everywhere. And to go to the Rumi quote, um, what it sort of tells me is, as opposed to hopefully saying, all right, we, we've had all these advances, as opposed to sort of just going back, um, what about if we found a detour, mm -hmm. uh, found another way? Uh, and that would be more constructive than just undoing what uh, has been done that's positive. So uh, find new ways, uh, invent the future as opposed to uh, reinvent uh, uh, the past. So I'm going to quote the review in The Economist of the book. It said, the book is a romp through all that's going wrong with politics, from populists on the rise, robots stealing jobs, climate change being ignored, and technocrats bereft of fresh ideas. Yet, there's an optimistic streak in the book. <laughs> of all that's wrong, what is fixable? And what do you feel the great thinkers should be putting their minds to? Well, if something is wrong, we have to fix it. So, mm -hmm. in a way, you, you have no choice if you're a human being and you, you, you're alive and you, you want to be engaged. I think you have to make a choice. Are you going to be optimistic or not? And I think that I'm on the side of optimism because you, it's, I think, a 
part of being a human to find uh, a path and find solutions. Mm -hmm. And the economists, I suppose, identified some of the issues, which I think are very real, uh, around democracy, around capitalism, around geopolitics, around what it means to be a human in the age of gene editing and AI. So these are, I think, very key questions that we think about at, at the Bergeron Institute, but frankly that we try to address in the book. And, um, but you've got to, I mean, as humans, as a species, so far, we've always found solutions. Has it been a straight line? Has it always been up? No. And um, one thing that we're going to talk about, I'm sure, is that the path to modernity has been quite different in the West uh, compared to mm. Asia. And this is the first time in a serious way at the global level that the two meet. It's an interesting time. We, we will get into that. Um, I'm struck by your um, enthusiasm in the book for the post-World War II order and all that it unleashed in a good way, including in China. You talk about China's mastery in harnessing that opportunity to build the prosperity that we see today in China. And yet, I'm confused personally by why democracy is taking such a beating around the world. And I just want to quote from Freedom in the World, Freedom House's 2018 report. We're in the 13th consecutive year of decline in global freedom. Um, the reversal spans every region and countries throughout the world. Uh, there's a crisis of confidence in democratic capitalism, and it's intensified. And of the 41 countries that were consistently ranked uh, from 1985 until now, more than half has, have registered net score declines in the past five years. What's going on? Well, I think it's a little bit what we talked about at the very beginning. You have a reaction to all this progress. And let's be honest, democracies are not easy to manage. And um, I think we, we are seeing that. Uh, even countries that have progressed from autocracies to democracies, actually in Asia, like uh, Korea or Taiwan, mm. uh, didn't do it in a straight line. And um, so I think, unfortunately, that's you know, part of change. Change is how to manage. And at a time when change is not just domestic, change is really global. Uh, and with the added sort of fuel of technology, I think that mm -hmm. challenges democracies and systems even more. Mm -hmm. And in the book, you talk about the rise of Donald Trump. You say he's a symptom, not the cause. And you call on in the book for evangelical globalists to curb their enthusiasm a bit. <laughs> well, you... Any ideology, um, to me anyway, has limits. Uh, it's an ideology for a group, and to conquer more, it takes time, and sometimes a good idea, sometimes a bad idea, and it's, at the end it's a fight. And the idea that everyone around the world should be cooperating and be happy together, um, it's a nice idea, but... Um, is it realistic? Uh, it wasn't the case 70 years ago. Um, it became a lot the case. But is it a surprise that it's not all the way there? No. Is it a surprise that there's a reaction? No. And to go back to your point about Donald Trump, I really do think uh, Donald Trump is a symptom uh, because it, he didn't appear in a vacuum. You had Obama twice, and then suddenly you have Trump. But it, they are connected. And uh, so we have to try to remember that. When I say they're connected, they may not be politically connected or in spirit, but they're connected in the sense that they came out of the same system, out of the same country and group of voters. Mm -hmm. Do you think, I'm always struck also by um, maybe a lack of understanding in the world of the ecosystem of prosperity created after World War II. And so all of these interlocking, you know, rules-based 
systems and trade agreements and everything that really provided for uh, and safe naval transport and all of that, that the U.S., I mean, this was Pax Americana. And now the U.S. is tired. Is Donald Trump or people that criticize the fact that the U.S. bore the burden of that and now calling on the world to share that burden and maybe a lack of appreciation in some countries as to how much they benefited from that system and how easy it is to crack it or lose it. I mean, are you worried that we may move from that rules-based system or open transport and, and safe transport through the world? So the international order was what it is, as you say. It worked, but it benefited some more than others. It also gave power to some more than others. And there is a real change, I think, in terms of the weight of the world, in terms of potential power. Uh, it's no longer just in the West. Uh, and that transition, I think, is not easy. So that's the first thing. The other is that some of the actors are no longer willing to play the roles they used to. The U.S. today clearly uh, is withdrawing. Um, Britain is withdrawing. Europe is not that strong and functional. So you have a vacuum, and the vacuum is being filled. It's being filled quite naturally by, let's say, China and Russia. And I think with more or less enthusiasm. I'm not that convinced that China is... <coughs> China, I think, is, en is enthusiastic about filling the vacuum economically, but I don't mm -hmm. think really politically. But the real question is, you know, when you have this vacuum mm -hmm. of leadership, including sort of cultural and moral leadership, um, how do you, in a world that's moving fast, how do you keep peace, prosperity, uh, a sense of destiny? Mm -hmm. Not easy. We hope you'll answer all those questions tonight. <laughs> or read the book. Uh, there's a lot of good thinking on it. So speaking of China, I'm going to quote from page three, because the book dives right in. It doesn't avoid the subject. It tackles it. And throughout the book, I think it's a strain that goes through it. And just to quote from page three, it says, when populists rail against globalization that has undermined their standard of living through trade agreements, they mostly have China in mind. Few reflect that China was able to take maximum advantage of the post-Cold War U.S.-led world order that promoted open trade and free markets precisely because of its consensus-driven and long-term oriented one-party political system. China has shown the path to prosperity is not incompatible with authoritarian rule. Now, this has been... It has been a doctrine of the liberal order that you have to have freedom to have prosperity. And this is the first time I think the world has seen a country that seems to be well on the path to prosperity without those kind of freedoms and with even greater repression having still the growth rates. How, tell, talk a little bit about what kind of game changer this is and what it means because this... Um, and I, I just want to mention the Bergruen Institute, I think you have two offices, Los Angeles and Beijing. So you've really invested in trying to understand what's happening in China, to connect with some of the best thinkers there. But what are the implications uh, for the world going forward? So the Institute has as you say, two centers, Beijing and Los Angeles, so east and west on purpose. Really today, the two opposites almost mm -hmm. politically and culturally. And if you look at China, China is no different than most other major countries in the world. It's capitalist, but it's also communist and Confucian. So it has culturally and politically uh, a totally different system. So the one uniting factor is capitalism. And as you say, it's quite unusual, at least we've never experienced, a very successful uh, market economy 
that is also uh, an autocracy and a one-party system. But it's worked for China so far. And I think it's worked for China so far because of its culture. Its very long culture is one of really um, sort of Confucian uh, order, uh, which somehow uh, works with a one-party system. doesn't mean that it'll be like this forever, but I think in our lifetimes it may very well be that. And I think for the West, it's a very difficult thing to accept that another country, a major country, uh, can be successful with a political system, a culture, an ideology that's so different. And I almost view it as a religious issue. We in the West are monotheist. We believe in one God, one truth. So can we accept that there is another truth somewhere else? In essence, can we say there are two truths living with each other on this planet? Not so easy. This is the first time. And we have a, we've had all these fights between Catholics and Protestants, uh, Islam, Christians. So here there is some there's a way of thinking in a culture that is even more different. So we have to grapple with that mm. and to accept that somebody else with a totally different culture is legitimate, not easy. So in this, you know, whatever it is, friendly competition or Cold War or whatever phase we're entering with China, would you see those different worldviews as being ones that would lead to potential conflict? Or why do you think, what are the sharp edges of those differences that really need to be worked on between the East and the West? Well, my own view is that for this century to be peaceful and prosperous, you need to have China and the West and especially China and the U.S., at least uh, tolerate each other. Uh, if they don't, mm -hmm. I think we're in trouble. But what I think is a clash of civilizations that is inevitable, at least in my mind, has just been sped up by the present U.S. administration. So the trade war is a way to speed up, I think, this, in my mind, uh, inevitable cultural conflict. Uh, so it's been sped up. And if you look at the US, Democrats and Republicans, I think, are equally happy to um, go against China, at least in terms of trade. Mm -hmm. So there's. I think a thinking in Washington that really transcends the Republican Party, or it's, it's widespread that whatever the era of, uh, as Zheng Bijan put in his book, the peaceful rise is over. And there's a new kind of leadership in China's ambitions have changed, and it's a break from, you know, the um, recommendation of Deng Xiaoping and others for China to you know, just focus internally on its own prosperity. Um, do you feel you've seen a change in all of that in the past few years? Or is there a fundamental, consistent approach that you think mainly the change has been in the U.S. or in the West? I think it's on both sides. If mm -hmm. you look at the uh, Xi administration, it's much bolder about <coughs> the achievements of China and of restoring uh, China as a respected and important uh, world player. So I think the Xi administration has been, uh, let's say, aggressive about China. Mm -hmm. And uh, the West has realized that China is real. And um, I think that 
creates a lot of uncomfort. So it's not surprising. The, what's interesting is the speed. Mm-hmm. And I just want to kind of tease out a bit um, your view of what you call the consensual form of government in China. Some would call it enforced consensus. Uh, how do you see that, and, and is that something that shows a new way that other countries might want to replicate? There's no chance that anyone in the West would mm-hmm. want or could different cultures, but I think that's part of the issue, is that there's, I think, a lack of respect for the fact that different places have had different histories and cultures. There's no chance that we in America or any Western countries that's had democracy would ever adopt, um, let's say, a one-party system. Mm -hmm. No chance. On the other hand, you have countries that have never had uh, a multi-party democracy like China. And will they adopt what we have, especially when they see the difficulties we have today? They're not ready for that. Some have gone there, Taiwan, Korea, but China I don't think is ready. Would Taiwan show that Confucius culture can mix with democracy very well? It does, but it's a smaller place Mm -hmm. and it took some time. Mm -hmm. And it became a democracy when incomes were quite a lot higher Mm -hmm. than China's today. So it'll take some time. And I think the Chinese will do everything, at least the party today, not to go there. Mm-hmm. So we, we have to be in trying to push China to, let's say, become more democratic in Western terms. I don't think it's realistic today to help China be more relaxed. Uh, certainly not the case today, uh, would be, I think, a nice thing. Um, and, but this has to be done in a way that's fairly subtle. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go to the audience after this next question, one last question on China. <coughs> we'll come back and we're going to discuss robots taking over the world and what we do about that and the future of jobs and prosperity um, in a moment. But I thought you, you quoted Kishore Mabani a few times in the book, and he made the point that from his perspective, all the people that hate globalization are the 15% of the world in the West. And the 85% of the world that isn't in the West loves globalization. And it's raised you know, billions out of poverty. And, the, and he says the last 30 years have been the best 30 years the rest of us have enjoyed. So is it true that the West has lost out on democracy, that it's been a zero-sum game? And in your book, you, you talk about that quite a bit. He says the reason the West doesn't like it is because those who have won in the West have, have refused to share the prosperity of globalization with everyone else, that it's uniquely a fault of the West that we've um, not figured out a way to spread the benefits. So I actually agree with Kesho. I think that globalization on average has helped the world, including the West. If you really think of it, the trade deficit that the US has run with China, in my mind, actually has benefited the US enormously because we've had other countries, but especially China, work for us and finance us because we have the reserve currency. That's not a bad deal. So we've had lots of goods uh, manufactured by somebody else, given to us, I mean, not right, sold to us, but on credit, and it seems forever credit. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it's so bad. I also agree with Kesho that... Um, the way the benefits have accrued, not just in the West, but all around, uh, haven't been um, that fair. And the inequalities that are increasing 
is a huge issue. And obviously, that's one of the issues that we need to face in the West. But China has the same issue. Mm -hmm. So we have questions from online. Is there anyone in the room? Gentlemen here. And introduce yourself, please, and get the mic so people can hear it. So we have one there, and then we'll come to you. Yeah. Hi, uh, Charles Anderson. My question relates to Hong Kong. How do you reconcile the two, the Chinese system with the move for democracy within Hong Kong, and what do you see as the outlook for that? Hong Kong is really tricky, and it shows they're very hard to reconcile. So, in a way, Hong Kong was a very unusual situation that sort of worked quite well as long as you didn't politicize any of it. And now they've become very political. And I'm not sure you can solve the political side, meaning China cannot give rights beyond what has been agreed to uh, in, the, in the agreement, um, the basic law. Uh, so China can't give that. And the protesters, from a political standpoint, want things that China can't give. So you have an impasse there. I think where you could have a bridge is that talking about inequality and talking about the, who's, been, who's benefited the most out of Hong Kong. Well, China's benefited, Hong Kong has benefited, but very unequally in Hong Kong. And if China... Uh, pushed Hong Kong to spread the wealth, which is enormous in Hong Kong, in a way that's more even, I think that would at least be a way to build a bridge. I think the political side is very hard to square because it's unsquareable. And we have this gentleman and then you, thanks. Uh, Robert. And then we'll move to this side. I'm Robert Klitzman from Columbia University. Thank you very much for a really wonderful conversation. You mentioned the need for moral leadership and that there's a vacuum uh, in terms of moral leadership, and I agree with you. I'm wondering, uh, do you see individuals or groups who might fill that and what that might look like or needs to look like? Well, I have an idea. Somebody like Rumi? <laughs> He hasn't been with us for about 800 years, so what shall we do? <laughs> but, that, but he had a lot of insight back then, yes. But that's a little bit the issue. Mm -hmm. The issue that um, I think a lot of the people who are politicians are too close to the fire, mm -hmm. so they're not that inspiring. They don't come up with really true uh, new ideas. And I hate to put this is pessimistic, but sometimes you have to sort of go through a period of pain potentially, before you come up with um, sort of new, inspiring leadership. But leadership comes with ideas. I think you need new ideas. So it's not just, oh, somebody who looks, you know, shiny on a wonderful horse. Mm -hmm. um, you need um, someone who's got ideas because you need, you need a change. That's why you created a philosophy. Well, that, could you tell yes. us about the philosophy prize? I, 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 I agree. Well, so the philosophy prize it may sound very abstract to most of you. Uh, the idea is simple. If you really think about who's made the biggest difference in our lives still today, in terms of culture, how we function, it's thinkers mm -hmm. who've made us who we are. And there may be Philosophers in a technical sense, they may be religious leaders, they may be crazy, um, um, whatever. <laughs> there have been lots of people who've influenced us who are great thinkers but don't fit in the category. But if you think of who still sort of leads our moral and cultural lives today in the West, uh, you could say, well, it's uh, the Greeks, uh, Aristotle, Socrates, 
its religious uh, leaders, from Jesus to others, its philosophers like Nietzsche or other thinkers like Karl Marx. In the East, it's Confucius, it's Lao Tzu. So these are still the people who, or Rumi, they, they have shaped us. So the reason for the philosophy prize is to reward a thinker every year uh, who uh, helps us uh, be who we are as humans. Let me ask you a question about this because I've just been through a period of reading all of Yuval Noah Harari's books, including Sapiens. And I have to say, I have tended to believe in my life that most people are good and then you have outliers who cause troubles and, you know, take freedoms and cause violence. He switched my worldview. His basic argument in that is that we, as homo sapiens, are pretty nasty creatures. We've killed off all the opposition. When our tribe is threatened, we do things like cause genocide to competitors. It also makes us very creative because we want to show we're better. But this whole point in the book is that maybe, like liberal democracy, this post-World War II order is a total anomaly in history that we've gone through a history of wars and destruction and competition, and we had this little blip that created, lifted us, you know, the world out of poverty and created huge gains in health and all of this. And I left that book thinking, you know, it maybe, maybe it's, that's the outlier of history. I wouldn't be that pessimistic. I Thank mean, God, I, I, I need I've, to be. I've, I need some optimism here. I've, I've, I've read the book. We, mm -hmm. we've, um, I have personally, luckily, and the institute engaged with uh, Yuval. Mm -hmm. I think he's brilliant, and I also think part of what he says in this book, which I think is more powerful, mm -hmm. is that we as humans, the, the, what makes us quite special, um, is that we cooperate, mm -hmm. and I think that because we cooperate, we've created all the things that have worked for us. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think cooperation is actually even more important. But we do get into fights, and we are competitive. And, you know, that's part of, you know, our, what as, as a species made us um, evolve and do so much. But it's also um, the, the other side of um, our dynamism. Mm -hmm. I want to come back and ask you if there are any areas, you know, I've had this dream that maybe the U.S. and China would come together to end polio in the world, for example, which, you know, we're down to less than a thousand cases. And if you had two great powers come together to do something good, maybe it would just send a signal to the world that we are cooperative beings and there are ways to help make the world a better place, uh, even as we compete. But we'll come back to that. You had a question. You've been very patient. Do you know how to use please chopsticks? Please introduce yourself. <laughs> Do you know how to use chopsticks? Could you please introduce yourself? Okay. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you why you're asking that question? I don't know. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's the heart of politics. Uh, the heart of everything it begins with eating. I don't know. <laughs> oh, but it's a good point, actually. It's yeah. a good point. You know, culture is, culture is everything. And chopsticks is culture. And uh, society? I don't know. Yeah. no, no, it's a, it's a good point. And uh, so, I mean, I, yes, I do use chopsticks, but I've been lucky because I've been, I've, I've spent a lot of time, you know, traveling the world. But I, it's key because food is key, and uh, and um, you know, different ways of 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 eating, of seeing things, uh, they make us who we are. So, yeah. So now I'm going to reveal my plan to save the world. Instead of having wars, that we get the barbecue experts of the U.S. from the South and elsewhere, and we put them together with the barbecue experts in China, and we have a cook-off. And whoever wins, right, we, we recognize. Because food, right, it's so passionate. And you go to China, everyone's so proud of the barbecue, the U.S. But I think we need more of you know, these bridges to understand each other, which I think was John D. Rockefeller's brilliance in founding Asia Society, was saying you can't just tackle these things
from an economic policy point of view or culture. You really have to tackle history and culture and, and food and art and build understanding. Well, culture at the end. So it's yeah. art, it's music, it's, yes, mm -hmm. I agree. These are the bridges, literature. Mm -hmm. um, I have to acknowledge my friend who is a real bridge between East and West, Ohan Pamuk. And today is the day when Nobel Prize were, winners were announced. And <laughs> Yeah, and talk about a crossroads of the world, Turkey. I mean, there's no other place where you feel Asia, east to the west, just it's... Um, okay, we had a question way in the back there. This side's feeling very neglected. Hey, uh, Philip Ellison, um, uh, from New York, studied it at Hong Kong U, as well as here. Um, hey, my, my question also with context is, do you have thoughts on artificial intelligence and facial recognition. In part, we see that in Hong Kong with the protests right now, but also in the US, AI and facial recognition biometric entry systems are being implemented in cities as well as housing, particularly in lower income communities as well. And so the tension, uh, for example, Amazon, the company Ring and police departments are monitoring people 24 seven when you implement the system. So. Why I ask that in particular is the tension between safety um, you know, and the right to assemble and protest and have social change to reach the things that you're talking about and uh, renovating our, um, our democracy. So do you have any thoughts on AI, facial recognition, and, and our, our path forward? So AI, as you, you know, indicate, is everywhere. And AI is becoming more and more powerful. So. Uh, AI, like any technology, is for good and for bad. Nuclear technology, you know, good and bad. So same with AI. And AI it is potentially the most powerful of all technologies. And it'll translate at all levels. So China and the West are also in a technological race. And... AI will be probably the area, maybe that gene editing will be the two key ones in terms of uh, the race. In China, as opposed to what happened maybe a century ago, a century and a half ago, doesn't want to be left behind. So they're going to invest a lot there. So are we. What's interesting is that in China, and this is the way China functions in general, government and the private sector cooperate. They have no choice and they cooperate. That gives them also certain strengths. We in the West, especially in the US, much less cooperation. If you think of Silicon Valley, they'd rather be left alone. And, but that's beginning to change because there's no choice uh, that the two are getting more entangled and will end up having to uh, work together and cooperate. So what does it mean? Uh, I think we will be safer, but I think our privacy is, you know, it, it's gone. Uh, and, and, and it may have, we may have legal rights, but those legal rights, you know, if there's force majeure or whatever, they're gone too. We just have to be realistic about it. So we're spending a lot of time here really looking at what we see as three huge fields of influence on AI and maybe irreconcilable. So the U.S., as you said, is very comfortable with companies having data. And we have three or four companies that really are becoming data monopolists. And we see places like MIT really starve for data. They can't even get access to it. In Europe, they don't want companies or government having data, right? And it's much more of individual right to protect data. And in China, there's now, you know, a, a full pathway for government to have control the access to data. And how do these worlds ever reconcile? Um, and are we set for three completely separate fields of influence in technology? You are. Uh, in terms of China, it's, it has its own internet, in essence. 
And, you know, the great, great wall of China, you could say it's the great internet wall mm. today. And um, Europe um, is all about regulation and protection, which is very nice, but, um, you know, will it foster innovation? Big question. And America has been very innovative, and Silicon Valley doesn't want to stop the innovation, so they want to have as little interference from government. But with something so powerful, I think it's going to be very hard to uh, mm -hmm. keep government out of Silicon Valley. So we're getting a lot of questions on online here, but I have to get to this side of the room. Yep. Thank you. Right here. And introduce yourself, please. I run the Performing Arts Center near Hudson, New York. So I, am, I want to come back to your reverence for the Greeks. You obviously are an enlightened philanthropist, and I'm very curious how you came to the idea of setting up your own institute instead of, let's say, investing your philanthropic um, support in a public institution, let's say, supporting liberal arts or uh, founding your own institution on the basis of an existing uh, program. Obviously not Harvard, but um, let's say a smaller place elsewhere with a strong art program. Um, I guess my question is um, a bit against the backdrop of many uh, wealthy individuals setting up their own museums and various other um, institutions of their own. Thanks. Well, it's, um, it's, a, it's a personal question. I don't, I, I don't want to take too much space for that, but the, the quick answer is that um, in my case, I grew up with my brother here in Paris, and uh, I was very interested in philosophy and politics, so I came back to this about a dozen years ago, really out of personal um, interest, and the institute grew out in a way that was very organic. So it wasn't that I decided, oh, let's create a big institute or something like that. We started doing some reform work in California, and it got some traction, then I felt, well, we should also be active in China because that's important to understand China for the West, so we set up there. So it really became organic, and now, well, we have an organization. So that's how it, it evolved. We cooperate with lots of others, and we have fellows at different um, institutions, including some of the ones you mentioned. So we work with others, and but we have the... Uh, luxury of being able to think very long term, to think maybe against the grain, having uh, a center in China and in the West, not so usual, and uh, we can do things with a little bit more risk than others by being independent, at least today. So um, we'll take another question on this side, right back there, but I'm going to go to Sarah, who asks via the internet, while you say that the American Western public will never accept the China model, what about non-Western developing countries, in particular those who are in great need of economic development, isn't the China model going to win out? I think it depends very much on the culture of each one of those countries. Because, again, I think there's a naive way, especially in the West, to say, all right, we have something that works, let's bring it, well, look at what happened uh, frankly, in Iraq or Arab Spring, we thought, well, you know, democracy is so wonderful, so, you know, if you open up the gates, it'll conquer every one of those countries and they'll turn democratic in a minute and uh, everything's going to be beautiful. Well, it didn't happen. So I think you have to match uh, culture with the system. So some uh, will gravitate towards a Western, uh, you know, multi-party system. Some... Uh, Culturally, uh, think of Vietnam, uh, it's still a one-party system, but they're capitalist and they're going to become more capitalist, so then they're going in the direction of China. Will they ever uh, become democratic? No idea. Uh, but, so I think it depends very much on the culture. And some um, don't have a, a tradition in either one of these camps, so they have to find their way. So was your friend Francis Fukuyama completely wrong? Not just, it's not the end of history, but when he said the liberal democratic orders won. Are we now in a full-blown competition between 
forms of governance in the world? So, I, so Josette, and I don't you're mean gonna it, you're, you're going to quote it, Rumi I, to me. No, I don't mean it in a, in a bad way, yeah. but the way you put the question mm-hmm. is symptomatic of our Western thinking, that mm-hmm. it's a competition, that one or the other has to win. And I think what we try to do in the book is to say, no, no, it doesn't have to be one or the other winning. It's maybe winning for the culture. Mm-hmm. So you can't, you're not going to have one system taking over the entire world or one culture taking over the entire world, at least not, I think, in our lifetimes. So you have to respect that there are different systems and, and that are adapted to a different culture. Does it mean that we like it, that we think it's just? No. But it means that... Um, it's not necessarily that one will win over the other. There's going to be a period of time, potentially, where you have different systems that need to coexist for the world to be um, at peace. In the back? And did you have a question? Hi, my name's Mona Mandeviron uh, from Manhattan Minds. I just wanted to get your thoughts uh, in terms of renovating democracy, you know, you're, you um, are from Europe, and democracy is a multi-party system in many countries, and here in the United States, it's a two-party system for the most part. Um, what were your thoughts on maybe trying to move into a multi-party system in the United States, if you thought that would be to our benefit, to sort of alleviate some of the polarization between parties? And then also, you know, to what extent might uh, it be necessary to have intervention to allow for um, candidates from smaller parties to have access to um, media beyond just public TV uh, to be able to compete in the campaigning um, for office, which is very much um, something that only parties who are the two parties who are very well financed can afford uh, to spread their message out and and if there is any evolution along um, that line that you thought would be to our benefit as a culture to maybe adopt more of a European multi-party system and how could we get there? I think it's a very good question. Um, and and I, I think it would be healthier if you didn't have just two parties because you'd create, you know, the parliamentary system in Europe forces a little bit more consensus in theory. But the reality is that I think political parties here and in Europe have, in essence, gotten destroyed and disintermediated. Political parties, even in Europe, don't mean that much anymore. They're being reshaped. And when I say disintermediated, what I mean is that people have, have, as citizens, gravitate towards movements and people. They have a direct voice, which they didn't really have, but now with social media they do. So it's much harder for traditional media or traditional political parties to play the role of a convener or an editor. And you see it actually in America. Uh, Trump hijacked the Republican Party. And um, is the Republican Party a traditional Republican Party today? Probably not. And I would say, on the Democratic side, you have so many different strands. And one of the difficulties of the Democrats in um, sort of finding a candidate that represents all of them and and in winning an election is that there are so many different strands. So I agree. I think the parties, including in the U.S., no longer represent um, the electorate. So that has to be rethought and changed. You know, I was curious, the, um, I just finished a book, How Democracies Die, by Stephen Levitsky, and they make the case that the two-party system is supposed to screen out outliers and screen out extremists and look at, you know, the situation in the U.S., but they also look at the situation in, in Venezuela and other places, or Hungary, where the, the parties are failing to keep out, um, you know, populists or other things. So that's a counter argument to that. But well, I mean, uh, let's ask the question: Do you do you think that's true? I think that uh, exactly the opposite is now happening. 
uh, the, especially because of the primary system in the U.S., the, the more extreme sides actually uh, have the advantage. So the middle is, win, is, is losing. The, the middle is definitely, uh, the, let's say, the voice of reason and the voice of coming together um, is, is a non-voice, unfortunately, today, uh, because it's not a sexy one. Uh, the two extremes um, gather the media attention and uh, they're the ones who, in essence, hijack the middle. So we're going to ask, uh, Stephen asks online, how does positive nationalism, which you recommend in the book, differ from regular nationalism? And isn't nationalism, by definition, often not positive? So it's a subtle idea, which Mm -hmm. you may find um, too subtle, um, which is that the idea is, as opposed to being against others, be for yourself. So first, think about who are you, what are your values, as opposed to saying, who do you not want to be and who do you not want? So uh, it sort of reverses. Um, uh, the traditional um, ideas of um, uh, nationalism. Mm -hmm. So a member of our chairman's circle here has a question, and he does a lot of work in China, so Steve Spahn. Stephen Spahn, and uh, I've been involved with the International Baccalaureate since its founding, and we have a school in China that's very unique. We have approximately 1,000 students, and actually... I asked them, how would the United States and China converge? And of course, they see that there's a new form of capitalism that we see emerging, which, we, which they call people's capitalism, where the regulations change so that creativity is allowed to flourish. They also see no difference between what they see in the West and the East in terms of democracy itself. They say it's really about people's democracy. If people are benefiting, and if they actually have that. So I see an an emergence coming in a a new way. And I'm wondering, uh, one of the most interesting things that happened of late is we actually met the head of Taoism, who fundamentally said, you know, you have, the world should be looked at in in its simplest ways, the way we think and the way we act. We have to have patience for our friends and our foes. And then we have to have empathy for all living beings, for all beings. That would be inanimate, inanimate. And I think that, what do you think, is that the path we're going to follow? Well, From roommate to Taoism here, <laughs> a global tour. Well, I think it's, I actually think it's, it's, um, uh, it's wise, it's, um, uh, I think it's nurturing and empowering, so I think it's very good. I think in terms of creativity and capitalism, the the world here and in China are both very creative and allow creativity. And I think that's very very good. But there's a difference. Um, The creativity is going to be much more edited in China than it is here. And that's one part that maybe... Uh, your students didn't uh, uh, talk about, but that's the reality. So, but creativity and capitalism um, exist on both sides. Inequality is also increasing. So I think one of the important things is what is fair. And as, this is one of the things we talk about in the book, um, as wealth is getting more and more concentrated, because of the creativity, uh, that's a good thing. Creativity helps all of us. We have more technology that is, let's say, our friend in many ways, health, communications, and all that. But it also concentrates wealth. International, I mean, intellectual property is worth more and more. Uh, digital rights are worth more and more. So the robots are worth more and more. So the question is, what do you do? And one of the things that we talk about in the book is the concept of pre-distribution. The idea being, as opposed to taxing the robots, which is the normal instinct, uh, own the robots. 
the idea is give a chance to uh, everyone to have a, a, a piece, an ownership in the IP, in the intellectual property. And um, uh, our thinking is uh, when companies are created, new ones, um, as opposed to all of it going to the capitalists, maybe a share should go to a sovereign wealth fund equivalent that's the benefit of society in general. So uh, all citizens, uh, the state, so that everybody shares in the uh, prosperity of businesses as opposed to actually dividing uh, society uh, along uh, winners and losers. And this has been done actually in a place that's not necessarily that popular in the West, that's Singapore, uh, where uh, Singapore owns a piece of a lot of the productive uh, functions of the country. It's owned by its sovereign wealth fund, which is the largest contributor to the budget. Therefore, taxes are low, services are high, the state is rich, and everybody in the country benefits uh, economically. So they are able to do it, and they have issues today of inequality as well. But um, they've been able to create this kind of um, uh, system, but not in a democracy. The question is, can you think in a democracy of spreading the wealth uh, in a way that's maybe more creative, more empowering than just taxes? Mm. You have a lot of economic ideas in the book. So one that's gotten a lot of attention and some controversy is this idea of pre-distribution of wealth <laughs> rather than progressive taxation or any of that. Could you explain the concept? Well, I sort of did. I yeah. don't want to bore it's not everyone. similar to that, but yeah. Uh, but the idea is that um, uh, you, as opposed to universal basic income, which I think makes the problem potentially worse. I mean, it could be a tool, but um, the idea here is universal basic capital. So everybody ends up becoming an owner if you want a capitalist, as opposed to some and some not. Question here? Um, yes, hi, my name is Jarrett Sloat, and I'm a recent graduate of New York University. And during my time at NYU, I studied politics. And I found that uh, in many of my courses, we were studying things that were taught as political facts. But when you look at the world today, they didn't really represent what was going on. And when reading your book, obviously, it's current. So you begin to see a reality shaping in what you discussed taking place in current times. So do you have any, um, I know you've been visiting college campuses like Harvard and Penn. Are you thinking of or planning to kind of like try and disseminate some of the ideas in your book? to academics to potentially be taught at the university level, or is it just something that hasn't been discussed yet? Well, Some new job opportunities for you, yes. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's for them to see if they think it's interesting and they want to uh, use them or, and adopt them or discuss them. So we'd be happy to have more discussions around these themes. No idea if our ideas is the right ones, but the, what I think is important is that new ideas be discussed. And I think that uh, maybe not enough. People mm -hmm. spend, and it's understandable because we're in a difficult time. And I think at the beginning of a difficult time, unfortunately, people complain a lot and they'll say, well, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And a lot of the um, solutions are sort of negative. But you need positive solutions. You need sort of creative and constructive solutions. I think those, um, we should be thirsty for. Four. We propose so many books, but there will be many others that are better and more creative. Can I, uh, I want to poll the audience for a moment. Um, and I'm going to ask you to express whether you feel this idea of competition to the end between the Western view of the world and governance versus the new model that China and others may be putting forward, or whether you believe we can chart a more cooperative future that kind of recognizes that there's differences. So how many of you feel we're, we're on a trajectory and it's just competition is going to intensify between the East and the West or China? 
And how many? And, and how many of you feel the opposite that we could? I'm not sure every audience in the U.S. would break down that way, but um, depends on the leadership, though, male, female. You think a female leader? Let's ask. Let's ask Nicholas. Do we need more women leaders in the mix here? Yes. I'm in favor. I do well, we notice. Have a, we have a, you see, we have a leader, age of society. Sure, please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Francine. I'm an artist for 40 years. And um, the process of creativity as an artist is to crack your own value to move to the unknown. So I have the feeling now with all the technology everybody is becoming an artist because if you see the millions of people taking a picture every day, everybody now wants to do the nice picture. But to do that, you have to spend time with yourself to go into research of yourself, mm -hmm. to transform yourself from selfishness, competition, uh, the ignorance, stupidity, and we all know all this jealousy, I mean, we can have big listing as human beings. But if you pass this transformation, then the culture between country disappear. The so problem is no time for people because of this making a living and surviving all over the world. There's no time for this personal introspection and growing. So let's get to Nicholas on this. And as you know, if I could just add to that, some people think we may be entering an era beyond work where creativity will rule and there will be ideas to spread prosperity in a different way. Uh, but also any thoughts you have on, you know, and maybe we're talking about Maslow's hierarchies of needs that, you know, we, we can transcend some of these other instincts. So I agree. I think that, you know, time for oneself, time to be creative, time to push um, who are we, why, why are we, who should we be, these, I think, are essential questions. And you're also right, I think a lot of people for, don't have the time or don't want to confront these. With technology, I think we'll have much more time uh, to do this. The question is, will we? Or will we get sort of captured by, um, you know, the networks, the whatever it is, because historically we have. I mean, there was a time when people used to spend hours and hours in front of TV in a very passive way. Maybe now uh, hours and hours with, uh, you know, um, little machines. And... Um, the question is, what next? Maybe uh, virtual reality. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if we change that much as humans. So we may have more time for ourselves, but will we use that time in a way that's um, as you know, wise and ambitious? If I could, just because we have a lot of questions and we only have a couple of minutes. So the woman back here and then Gal to you. Bahat, and I live with one foot in uh, the United States and another one in Israel, uh, both democra democratic countries, very different. And it seems to me that you are talking about renovating democracies, not necessarily demo democracy. That is, the, I cannot imagine Israel ever we, in a two-party uh, system, but I would like to see it with less parties in order for it to be able to function. Mm -hmm. So um, I still believe, I still subscribe to what Churchill has said, that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. Uh, so the question is, how do we renovate uh, democracies on the basis of the culture of the countries in which democracies need to be renovated? And Nicholas, if you don't mind, because we're running out of time, can we just take a few questions and then... You can sum up any closing thoughts you have. Do you need sure. pen, notes? No. Well, 
So go. We'll see. You'll help me. Yes. Um, Adrian Brody, I am retired. I have a question, um, two phases. It strikes me that China is actually quite fragile in the context of climate change and demo demographics, that uh, it is moving towards rap very rapidly a one-to-one -one ratio of workers to retirees, which is quite unusual in a high-tech, reasonably well-off country. It still has a very high proportion of its workers who are ill-educated. And it seems to be very exposed both on an industrial basis and on a um, water management food production basis to climate change. Would you please comment on that? OK. And we're, we're, we're really spanning the globe hill here. And the gentleman in front of him. Hi, thank you. Um, one of the ways to think about the changes you're, you're talking about in your book and in this conversation is that, to some extent, we're moving from an Aristotelian world in which, like, moderation and the golden rule guide us to the truth, to a more Hegelian world in which the truth is in kind of opposite extremes. Will you agree with this framework? And if so, what role do you think political correctness has in it? Wow, and I'm going to really make this a mashup by asking one last question from online. Let's come back to the U.S. What do you think of Andrew Yang's candidacy and $1,000 a month per person? So we have Israel renovating democracies, less parties, China vulnerabilities, Hegelian future, and Andrew Yang. Good luck. Okay. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Somewhere they all connect. Um, so n not to be, uh, uh, I mean, not to be name dropping, but it was interesting. <laughs> we had a meeting at the Institute with Xi Jinping. This was a few years ago, and it was exactly that. Uh, we asked him like 10 questions in a row. Mm -hmm. And he didn't take one note and then answered all of them, <laughs> you know. Oh. Uh, so. Okay, you're on. Let's see. So, I'm not as good. Uh, Andrew Yang, no comments, frankly, on, on elections. I think that that's, you know. How about $1,000 per person? Uh, I think less money in politics, better. Okay. Uh, then uh, on the Hegelian versus Aristotelian um, uh, framework, yes, I think we, we're, we're in fighting mode as opposed to in, uh, in uh, coming to, you know, coming up with solutions. And I think that this is the time we're in, and the question is for how long. Uh, ultimately, we only build a future by coming together, not by um, uh, just fighting. And, um, but there will be winners. Uh, going back to, at the end, going back to Hegel, there will be a synthesis, and there'll be you know, there'll be some winners in terms of the fight we're going through right now, and then we'll have a more constructive world. Um, in terms of China, uh, my own feeling is, yes, China has issues, uh, but China also has an ability to deal with these issues that is different than ours uh, because of the cohesion, because of the one-party system, because of... Um, <coughs> Also, frankly, even though uh, their population is aging, uh, it's still quite young, and uh, so they have time. And technology, in my mind, this is my own opinion, will help them a lot, uh, uh, including around climate, and um, if they apply themselves. So I think they have issues, but they can deal with them somewhat better, and the, pop the average age, I can't remember what it is, is still reasonably young. Uh, and then in terms of political parties, I think you have to, as you said, each country has to find its own way. I don't think there is a... You, you, that's why actually the name of the book, go back to the book, is okay. Renovating Democracy as a general uh, subject, uh, because each democracy uh, is different. I agree very much. Mm -hmm. 
And any thoughts on Israel and... Well, that was, that was the, yeah, okay, good. That was the response. So um, the books are in the back. If any of you want one, I too have it very marked up. It, it is really excellent, and it really explores these issues in depth, very thoughtful. As you may know, Nicholas published an earlier book on this seven years ago that I read and remember thinking it was ahead of its time because these things weren't front and foremost, and now uh, this much more in-depth look at these issues is uh, very timely. Could you join me in thanking, thanking Nicholas for growing? Thanks.